and let's see how people are actually using it. So how can this be used? And I just want to point out one really cool thing here. This is an utter and water sculpture made by my colleague, uh, Spencer Arnold. And I just want to point out it's an angler fish and we were able to actually get a light to light up on the end of it with the electricity. That has no benefit to the environment whatsoever. It was just something cool to do. Um, all right, so let's look at the benefits a bit. So in the beginning, I made you guys sit through that really depressing bit about coral bleaching and climate change. And the reason for that was that one of the ways that I see this um, mineral accretion technology or biorock technology being most valuable is in terms of protecting coral from bleaching events. This is the data that we had on our HINFI site, that one that I mentioned we built with the, the Thai community in 2008. And this is by 2010. It's not yet that uh, covered in corals, as you can see in the photograph. We, it's a quite deep site. Um, but what we find, let's look at the, the right side here. Off the site during 2010, during that mass global mass bleaching event, 55% of the corals on the reef were completely white. They had no zooxanthellae left in them. A further 34% were partially bleached, meaning that, you know, like this one here, it's, it's, it's lost most its color, but there's still some zooxanthellae left in there. Given the right conditions, this one would come back very easily. It would recover. But the ones that are white have much less chance of, of recovering. So, at, and only 10% were considered healthy on this date. Now we look just on the same day, just about 10 meters over to the side. And what we see here is almost a night and day. Um, only 1% of the corals are fully bleached. About 42% are partially bleached. These are the ones that have lost most of their color, but are likely to come back pretty well because they still have zooxanthellae in them that just needs to propagate outwards. And a total of 56%. So, you know, as much as we had completely white corals on the actual reef, we had healthy corals on our biorock structure on Hinfi. And after the bleaching event, these corals came back. So you can see here's this little uh, Acropora table coral here, completely bleached. Uh, maybe, I don't know if what's going on here, we can see some dark spots, but there's no zooxanthellae left in this coral in 2010 on the side of Hinfi. It was able to survive and come back. In 2014, over here on the top right, it again bleached, came back again, and continued to grow great. So this is Acropora is the most, was one of the most susceptible coral genre to bleaching. It's uh, one of the genre that many scientists think is going to go extinct because of coral bleaching. And we can show survival, good survival on our structures. And it's not the only one, um, you know, there's plenty of them that had survived on this structure. So that's one way we can kind of do this. We can, it kind of allows us to create what you'll hear um, from the BioRock company a lot is coral arcs. Um, the idea of like Noah's Ark. So you can get ahead of the storm, build one of these structures, get corals on it. And the bleaching is, you know, an odd, um, you know, much like a flood in the case for corals that it wipes out all the, the living stuff. And so you basically have this coral arc down in the water where corals can survive. And then after the bleaching events done, um, they can start to reproduce sexually and reseed the reefs around them. Um, it creates a biodiversity bank, and that leads us to its next use is to create these kind of biodiversity banks. And this idea is kind of like they're doing, um, is it Sweden or Norway, um, putting all the seeds from around the world into these big vaults to create these genetic banks for the seeds um, to preserve that genetic material. We can kind of create these living vaults for coral um, genetic material. And this is in addition to the stuff work being done by NOAA to actually freeze a lot of these coral genetic, these coral gametes. Um, but this is like a living place. So you could have this, you know, if, if you're a reef manager in your area and you know that your shallow reefs are very susceptible to humid 
um, anthropogenic threats and bleaching and all this, you create one of these areas off, off the reef out in the middle of the sands where there's less human in intervention, less problems, less issues. Um, and then you can transplant corals there and keep them there as a sort of bank. When you need corals, you can go and grab these ones and put them back, or you can just allow them to reproduce sexually and seed the reefs for, with future generations. So this is one really great way that, it's, that I see this being used that is very different from other coral restoration techniques like artificial reefs and even coral nurseries. To, with coral nurseries, we can do this to some degree, but you know, it's, it's not as effective or efficient. Um, the most we can do with the coral nursery is when a bleaching year occurs, we can lower it down deeper into the water. So it's at deeper depths, cold, cooler water and less light. But this, we don't have to do that. We can just have it electrified and these corals are growing great um, and, and less susceptible to threats. So another major problem around the world is beach erosion. And uh, I just have this photo from Thailand. It's probably not the best photo, but uh, it does demonstrate how in Thailand they try to protect the beaches. So we can see this tree here. This tree has obviously been here a very long time. Um, the roots were deep into soil and now they're completely exposed because all the soil is going away. And we could also pull out pictures of seeing hotels and, and houses and stuff falling into the ocean. The reason this occurs is that the reef is gone out here. There used to be a nice reef. It used to break the waves. Um, now that reef is gone and the waves make it in further. There's of course other reasons that going on on land that contribute to this. But a lot of time what they do in Thailand is just put out these bags of sand, plastic bags full of sand. These are good for, I don't know. I have no reason, I have nothing. There's no benefit to these really. They, they might stop this little bit of beach from eroding away, but then this all breaks apart and all this plastic goes into the ocean and it, we just create more problems for ourselves. Another way that people will do this is cover this area in concrete. Like you'll see a lot of shorelines have concrete blocks uh, or they'll put a concrete seawall out here. But of course, concrete's expensive, difficult to build contributes to climate change and also it breaks and so when it breaks you have to repair it, it doesn't function as well so the idea with the mineral accretion devices is to actually create living seawalls so to not do something really artificial but to just assist with how nature would normally protect our coastlines which is through living reefs and with the mineral accretion device we get corals growing very well on these we can create breakwaters. If this was to be hit by a storm and the mineral accretion that's growing on here was to break off, this would just regrow back again. So it's self-repairing. And actually one use for mineral accretion is to repair concrete, um, cracked and broken concrete. So this would rather than being putting up plastic bags or, or concrete walls that reduce water quality and don't actually work that well, um, to just simulate what nature does, a type of biomimicry um, and, you know, kind of assisting, assisting nature rather than going against it. So seawalls, um, wave breaks, shoreline protection is another big way um, that these, these devices have a lot of potential to be utilized around the world um, and unfortunately today um, aren't being done so. Another one that was just highlighted in a recent publication was the fact that our oceans have a lot of oil and gas structures in them, uh, about 7,500 uh, 7, of them. And most of those, 85%, are gonna become obsolete in the next 10 years. They can no longer be used. So there's different methods of disposal. Um, you know, they might be just left, they might be broken down, they might be shipped back and, and taken apart and sold as scrap. Um, but, you know, these areas, they're kind of areas of biodiversity. I mean, if, if you're a scuba diver, you know, when you jump out into the blue, into the open ocean, you'll spend your dive pretty bored um, because you're not going to see too much out there typically. But if there's anything out there, like say a floating raft of debris or any type of object, it's going to just be surrounded by life. And so these oil platforms um, are oases of life. 
And um, I've worked with some of my colleagues uh, monitor the, the oil platforms around the Gulf of Thailand. And it's just some of the most incredible diving I've ever seen because they are so full of pelagic fishes and whale sharks, and they're just covered in, in all these clams and barnacles. I would think it would be better. Um, and that's, you know, the, this paper that came out recently um, proposing that, you know, why don't we just turn these into these little islands of biodiversity? And if the oil and gas companies have been destroying our marine life for so many years, how about we turn this into a good thing and use these structures to help protect marine life? Um, it's going to be hard for a fisherman to get a net in here as well. So it kind of gives them some refuge from all the trawling and, and commercial fishing that's going on in our oceans around the world. Um, so all we'd have to do is instead of investing tons of money into breaking these down, is to put solar panels on them and electrify them. And we would turn them into mineral accretion devices. And they would start to grow these minerals. So another, um, another use for this, and if, if I'm sorry, if you um, wanna know more about this paper, I thought I had it, um, but I'll link it at the end as well. Um, it's, it's a really good paper. So the other thing I, I mentioned it already, but is you know the creation of these minerals. Some of these minerals are quite valuable. Uh, I mentioned that um, you know Singapore, they're trying to look at doing this to mine magnesium. Um, so Singapore obviously is a very small nation, but very heavily populated. And so one of the things that they have to do is desalinate ocean water to provide for drinking water. And in the next 30 years, they're looking to become the world's largest, um, you know, the, the center of, of, of desalination. That desalination, when you take out the fresh water from seawater, you're left with a brine. And so a very concentrated, um, you know, um, saline, saline water. You can take that brine and you can mine the minerals out of it. And we'll talk tomorrow about what minerals are in water, but you know, other than magnesium and, and stuff, there's a lot of trace minerals, uh, even you know, gold and, and uranium and stuff like that, some, some very um, expensive minerals that we can grow on this. So, and, and just while I'm here, you know, looking, this is actually, this is from Professor Hilbert's, some of the mineral accretion work that he did. And you can see in the middle is all just normal um, steel rebar, and then this has been electrified and grown all of this calcium carbonate on here, this aragonite, calcite, and brucite. And uh, these are some other drawings um, from Professor Hilberts. This is from a, I can't remember the year, 1979, I think, magazine from um, Tokyo. And I'll link this as well at the end. But this is um, his drawing, just showing all the different ways that this can be used. And we see a lot of the ways we've, we've talked about previously. He's got right here, the oil and gas structure. He's got, you know, coral nurseries, shoreline protection, aquaculture, um, and uh, even like, looks like underwater habitats under there, sea walls, all these things that can be utilized, that can be assisted with this technology. And in um, big artificial reefs here, I should mention as well. Um, and my favorite, is uh, another one. This is from Progressive Architecture all the way back in 1970, um, also from Professor Hilberts, showing these kind of ideas of having underwater cities, which is really my dream for the future. I, I would love to go live under the ocean. Um, and so, you know, all these types of things, you know, we, we, we can see how it can be used today, but there's really no limit to our imagination. You know, 71% of our ocean, of our earth is covered in ocean. And we know more about the surface of the moon than we do that ocean. Um, and so getting us living in there would, would be incredible, I think. Um, and mineral accretion could be a major part of getting us there. So that's just a selection, um, a small selection of how it can be used. Um, and this is why we really need the diversity of people um, in this, not just, you know, marine biologists and stuff looking at this, we need uh, engineers and architects and, and people from all different backgrounds who can have different ideas about how to use this technology and how to put it to our benefit and our planet's benefit. 